Hey everyone, the Revoice Conference is coming up very quickly, October 6th through the 8th. On the 9th of October 6th, we will be doing a live recording of our season finale, the whole Life on Side B co-host team, right after our very own Elizabeth speaks at the opening session of Revoice. We are super excited. It's going to be a great time. If you are going to Revoice, please come and join us after the main session at night. Um, and we will have a good old time finishing out this season. Also, if you're going to be at Revoice, we are going to have some uh, special merch that we will have for sale that will only be available at Revoice. So it's going to be a really great time. Come join us. We can't wait to see you. Hey, y'all. This is Grant. Life on Side B is a ministry of Posture Shift, a missiological ministry equipping church leaders and parents on LGBTQ inclusion and care. You can learn more at PostureShift.com. We also want to thank all our patrons who keep the podcast going and growing through their continued giving. If you love this podcast, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash life on side B. Now let's get into the episode. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. This is Henry and Ashley with Life on Side B back for another episode. And we have our friend Dean joining us. And so, hello, Dean. How are you? Good. How are you guys doing? I am well. Thank you. Ashley, how's it going over there? Oh, I'm having a week, but it's okay. Right. Truly, I get that. (laughs) But, oh my gosh. We will make it through, persevere through another day. God, Dean, I love your smile. I always think that. Love your smile. Oh, thank you. oh my goodness. Well, oh, thanks. Yes. Okay, well, it's been a while since you were on the podcast. We would love to hear some updates about your life as you are willing to share. So what's the tea? What's the 411? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, this setup is very different than sitting at the edge of a bed in an Airbnb talking to a laptop. Um, <laughs> that was the lo- a long that was way. A very long way. I had, like, an official email document i uh, like all this stuff this is this whole setup like whoo it was a long oh. way so uh i haven't been season the only one, one that's been going through a lot of changes yeah season yeah. one was a different world oh was that the, <laughs> was that the last time you were on yeah i have not yeah. Been oh on. oh yeah things one. have changed oh things have changed yes <laughs> gosh this is like going season one of rupaul's drag race to like all-star seven like <laughs> We'll take it. We'll take it. Oh my goodness! Um, Well, welcome, welcome back. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, Uh, excited. Yeah, life has changed a lot. So, oh gosh, back in season one, uh, let's see, I was living in Central Illinois, had uh, a young daughter, was working in a church, uh, was married, and now about the only thing that's still the same is I still have a daughter. Um, and I'm working at a different church, and everything else is basically different. Um, I moved up to northern Illinois, so I'm in the Chicagoland suburbs. Okay. Um, I'm careful to say Chicagoland, because when I say Chicago, uh, people who live in the city yell at me. Yeah. <laughs> they like to remind me that I don't live in the city. So, yeah. Chicagoland <laughs> suburbs. Okay. Is where I live. Uh, yeah, and... I'm working at a different church. Um, there's a whole journey there. Of I left the church I was at back uh, back in 2019, and went and worked for a couple of different ministries in between. Then, in the start of the pandemic, the pandemic hit. Good old COVID, and lost all my jobs and spent about a month out of work. And then there was a, another church nearby that picked me up as a pastor. And okay. Uh, yeah, I worked for them up uh, from May 2020 up through the end of 2021, and then lots of things were going on in my life, which I know we'll get into, but uh, an ch- opportunity opened up at a church here in the Chicago suburbs, and this is where this is where God led me, and so that's where I've been for almost a year now. It's really weird 
to think. Like, I've been living in the Chicago area for almost a year now. I'm coming up in just a few months to that to that point. But, yeah, so that's that's new. I, I work with, more directly with kids these days. My church has a daycare, and so uh, my primary focus actually is working with a lot of those kids in the daycare and their families, providing... I love that. Yeah, you know, spiritual support, connection to the church... And everything so i have like the best time ever because i basically get to go in there have fun with kids under the age of five and then i don't have to like then keep teaching them the rest of the day i can like take a break when they get yeah. crazy it's, it's like perfect um, i love that yeah so that's that's the update for my life bringing you up to 2022 like said, okay very very different Yes. You definitely uh, you describe like... working in daycare differently than my sister does. <laughs> <laughs> she has That's the room funny. with one-year-olds, though. So. Oh, uh, I'll see. In okay. In the midst of potty training. I will. Okay, potty training is awful, but I will say, like the toddler room is one of my favorites. I go in oh, there. Really? I oh my gosh, I love our toddlers because I go in there their faces just light up because someone is like talking to them and interacting with them. They will run around, they'll give you toys and then take them back. Uh, these kids love to just like, I'll sit down and they will just come up and they'll fight over sitting in my lap. Like they are the sweetest toddlers ever. And like, I never want them to grow up. I just, I want to have them stay toddlers forever. So I can just always go into that room because it always makes me happy to be in there. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Just in a quick bird's eye view. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to zoom in on something you said, if you don't mind. Um, one mm -hmm. of the reasons we're talking today is we're talking about divorce. And yep. so thank you for coming on and being willing to share your story. We know it is not an easy journey or topic. So just thank you for walking uh, us yeah. through your story. So can you tell us more about that and kind of, yeah, just yeah. start however you want to from there, and then we can ask you some questions throughout. Yeah, it's uh, really 2021 was the year when uh, my, my life blew up in 2021, is the best way to phrase it. They were, yeah. Looking back retrospectively, it is interesting to see, to think like looking backwards, in hindsight, I can see so many things now and go, wow, I wish I'd. I wish I'd seen that then. I wish I'd known that then. And I don't know if it'd be nice to think that there would have been a bit of a different outcome if I had seen how things were not going well earlier. But I can't do anything about that. But 2021 is kind of when everything blew up. And uh, mm -hmm. in this, I want to be respectful because this ultimately, um, separation and divorce is not really something that anyone wants. You don't get married to plan to have a divorce. I have always married. said that. Yeah. I've always said that divorce is so painful because nobody walks down the aisle or puts a ring on somebody's finger thinking, oh, one day this is going to end and I'm going to be completely fine. Yeah. No, that was not that was not the thought process at all. No one went into this thinking, you know, several years down the road, we're going to be parting ways. Uh, yeah. But there were some things that started to happen uh, in Lisa's life that were extremely painful and extremely difficult. And it just kind of started pulling the whole family into this spiral. And there came a, a breaking point of both of us realizing that the marriage was the marriage was not where it should have been. Uh, we had different ways of describing it, but ultimately the marriage is not where it should have been, and something had to change. Mm -hmm. And when it came down to it, there there was not an agreement on what that change could look like. How could we rebuild? How could we solve? How could we fix? How could we repair? There wasn't an agreement on that. Mm -hmm. And essentially it was both of us saying, here's what I need for this relationship to continue and here's what I can't accept for the relationship to mm -hmm. continue and if you imagine like two ropes that are there are, you know two posts that are into the ground and you're trying to connect a rope in between them and the pieces mm -hmm. just cannot meet or be brought together mm -hmm. that's essentially what it came down to there was 
uh, you know, there was not a way for us to meet together because there wasn't any middle ground. There was simply our endpoints, and they, they weren't going to be together. Um, so there was a... There was simply a, a this is where my endpoint is, this is where my endpoint is. When we realized they couldn't meet, we said, well, there's really just kind of one option after this. Um, and again, it's not an option anyone wanted. So we separated uh, in 2021, and it uh, we had to still remain in the same house while separated because Oof. we couldn't afford yeah. to get just another place to live. And then some stuff started happening with my job where I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay in that area of Illinois. So just imagine living with your ex for several months. Um, it's quite the experience. <laughs> and mm. yeah, one I don't ever recommend anyone trying out. Yeah, that uh, sounds really tense. I've known a friend who's actually done that and it did not go well. No, it is, you, you basically, you have this place you're living where really there's only one space you can actually reside. Because there's yeah. only one space <laughs> that is yours, and only one space that are theirs, and the rest is kind of like a war zone or a battle zone, where like, yeah, yeah it's neutral ground, but there's no such thing as neutral. Like, you're mm -hmm. not coexisting in the same places. So it was a couple of months later that uh, I moved to Chicago. Uh, the Chicago area, and that brought a lot of reprieve um, and definitely mm -hmm. helped start providing really the process to heal for each of us because I, I, there was no way to heal while with it. It's almost yeah. like the heartbreak just was continuous every single day, mm -hmm. no matter what, because I was... You can't heal in the same... In, yeah, you can't yeah. heal in the same environment that like you were hurt in. Like, yeah, you need some space away from it. Yeah, it's like... Expecting a wound to heal when it's opened every single day. Yeah. You just reopen every single day. You're not, that's not, that's never going to heal until you actually close it up and leave it alone. Then it can start to yeah. heal. But until then, it's just there and it's re exposed and it's just more stuff gets into it and it digs deeper. And yeah, so that that's what happened with this. So currently, the separation is still ongoing. The divorce process is close to being finalized. Uh, it's, one of the things to learn about divorce is not only uh, a heartbreaking process. Honestly, it's a very expensive, it's a very and expensive difficult movie. process. Uh huh. I I one of the things that I was thinking about was I'd always remembered uh, in church people using this statistic of oh you'll only find divorce rates higher in like middle upper middle and rich. Uh, classes like we don't there's no divorce in the lower class and they used to always use that as this like oh it's because money doesn't make you happy and all those sort of things and now I'm going no lower classes just don't get divorced because they literally cannot afford it yeah like the lawyers the paperwork fees even if you do it yourself and agree on everything the paperwork fees and having to have the basic lawyer to sign it is still so expensive so I was like oh I think some people just either like leave the marriages intact, like, legally and just go on with their lives, or they just don't get married because they don't want to incur legal funds. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I understand why there's not that much divorce in lower classes. Yeah. Because they literally can't afford it or Boy. get access to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Divorce is a privilege, you would have thought. <laughs> it's a very... <laughs> uh, it's a very strange to phrase that that way, but honestly... Yeah. It yep. really has become a privilege to be able to get a divorce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In this economy? And, so, yeah. In this economy. In this absolutely. Economy. Yes. Oof. So, oh my yeah. So that's that's why we're here today, I, I know, because uh, it's one of the things that I even thought about. Um, I had reached out to to Josh, because uh, Josh is a, is a dear friend, and I, I remember reaching out to him about like what was going on and giving him an update. And, you know, my personality is I'm always going to feel bad for everything and everyone. So I reached out to him and I said, look, I said, I know that there are these podcasts sitting out there with Dean happily talking about being married. And I said, I want to apologize now for 
this for basically having to go through a separation and divorce because I don't want that to impact your podcast negatively. Yeah, so um, for those that don't know, like Dean said, the last time he was here was in season one, and he talked about both him and his ex-wife did episodes talking about what mixed orientation was from both his perspective and from the straight perspective, and you know, and it was a it it was a favorite episode for a lot of people. It was a very listened to episode. So, um, but no, I don't think that's anything to feel guilty about. It's just it life happens to people. Yeah. Life happens, and so thank you for wanting to circle back as life has happened and uh, yeah. being willing to talk about that. And be vulnerable with us, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I may ask, before we dive into the kind of community aspect of things, um, and feel free to not answer anything I ask, because um, it's very personal, obviously. <laughs> but when you look back and uh, you think about mixed orientation marriage and you think about... Uh, your decision to get married, is there anything in hindsight, I mean, hindsight's always 2020, but is there anything looking back like, maybe this should have been something I hadn't done, or is it like, you know what, I'm glad for the experience, and grateful, and the Lord still uses it somehow, obviously you have a child, and so that is a wonderful thing, Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously having a child, I've, I've wanted to be a dad since I was like five years old. I mean, since I was a child, I wanted to have a child. And yeah. being a dad is my favorite thing ever. My my daughter is my my life, my everything. And I, I would I would never give her up. I mean, in this process, I, I drive I I do all the driving to see her. So I drive probably about twelve to thirteen hours a week to go pick her up have her spend time with me, and then take her back so she can go to school. Mm-hmm. So, wow. and let me tell you, during the gas price increase of the summer, that was <laughs> that was a very high investment, not only of time, but also of gas money. Um, yeah. But, but, yeah, and looking back, and I'll, I'll be vague about this because there is something very personal about this, and I, and I sure. will say this, if anyone listening wants to talk more about this and get more personal, um, please reach out to Life on Side B and they'll put you in contact with me because I would be happy to talk about this more one-on-one with individuals asking questions. But there were some things looking back at the very beginning that I can now honestly say that if these things had been discussed or had been known, there would have been a different decision on the relationship from the very beginning. Mm. Because there were certain things that... And my belief hasn't changed on this, even going through the divorce. Certain things that have to be present for any marriage to work or for any relationship, whatever the orientation of the individuals inside, has to be there for it to be long-lasting. There has to be a very strong, pure foundation. And if you're starting with the foundation completely cracked or even pieces of it missing or hidden... It's not going to bode well when difficult times do come. That part. So, uh, uh, like I said, that's very vague. But I, because I do want to answer somewhat. But there are some things again. I, I do want to keep a little more yeah, personal, obviously. just for that's... out of respect for still for for my ex and uh, for what she's going through as well. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. Um, So, with, obviously, that life change and separation, there comes uh, uh, when people know you as one unit, and then now you and this person are two separate units. How did that impact your friend group, community, support system, structures, family? Um, Yeah, what did that look like? Oh, gosh. Well, and the odd thing is, there was already a lot of shifting in my community around this time anyway, unrelated to the divorce. I had, in 2021, like I said, my life fell apart in 2021. The divorce, separation and divorce, was a massive part of that. And there were also things like several of my good friends and close friends moved away. They moved out of that area of Illinois. And so that relationship changed and altered. Mm-hmm. It, it honestly became a little more difficult to have those relationships. Um, and then, of course, I lost my closest partner uh in the process 
uh, not even through the separation. It had started really prior to that leading up to it, but I, I had lost the person that was there for me my whole life and was going to be there with me for the rest of my life. So that shifted as well. There were some friends that said we're going to choose a side, and they chose my ex's side. Mm-hmm. Um, there were there were a few people that wanted the ones that wanted to take my side. I told them that they couldn't. Yeah. Um, I said you know I said no one in a divorce should take a side. I said have compassion on both of us. I said you may choose to think and do what you want. I said but don't look at this as taking a side. Yeah. If you see yeah. my ex, I expect you to show compassion and care and kindness like you would anyone. Yeah. Um, that was not necessarily reciprocated. So there were some friends that stepped away from me, mm-hmm. um, and I lost some of those relationships. And then I moved at the end of That's the year. And you moved, yeah. And restarted in a place where I didn't really know anyone, and in a smaller church setting where there wasn't an abundance of people my age. Yeah. And I was coming to them out of a freshly out of a marriage, which is a lovely, wonderful taboo thing still in yeah. the church world. Um mm-hmm. with them getting to know me and getting to know my daughter, but then also recognizing like, oh, if I see Dean during the week, he's just by himself. If I see him on the weekend, he has a child. And he's pretty yeah. like focused on his daughter because that's the time that he has with her. So yeah, community just went awry in so many different ways. And I, I did what I could to try to kind of restructure things and, and say, okay, I'm going to stick with some of these relationships or I'm going to try to do this more if, they, if they're if they long distance. But it's just life got in the way and that kind of fell apart. So over the past year, it's been a slow rebuilding of community from some of the kind of remnants that were left, some of the people that I was able to really maintain those friendships with in some way, moving to a new place and trying to build some new friendships and relationships and some good community up here. Um, so yeah, there was my whole community shifted uh, as well. I look back at 2020 and I just, I think like, wow, there's so many people that I don't, talk to or I don't have a really close friendship with anymore that I did in 2020 and like say the start of the pandemic it's completely different now so yeah my whole community shifted and that is not in common with the divorce like I said just it happens yeah anyway um and mine was partially related to the divorce partially related to everyone just had life change post uh covid yeah. Everyone was doing different things. They they had time to think and consider, and so they all made these decisions, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there going, well, okay, where's, so where do my decisions end up taking me in all of this? Um, but yeah, I, I've had the fortunate blessing of having a couple of friends that stuck with me through the whole process and, and really stayed with me through it. Because one of the things I did notice was that going through a divorce, there's a lot of people that they they want to be there for you. And they'll even say, like, I I don't know how. And I I get that, absolutely. But there are some individuals that when you say, like, I'm going through a divorce or I'm about to go through this process, because they don't know what to do, they end up just pulling back a little bit. Yeah, because they feel, like, uncomfortable, don't know how to, Mm -hmm. like, engage it. Mm -hmm. They don't mess it up. Yeah, and I one of the things I realized about divorce, so we're in a world where, in a secular world, divorce is not really taboo at all anymore. And even in the church world, someone coming in who says, oh, I'm divorced, I mean, we're starting to change that in the church world where we are starting to take better care of them. But the church world doesn't really know what to do with someone who says, hey, I'm in the process. Because it's almost like the sense of, okay, you're doing something really bad right now, mm-hmm. so we're not going to talk about it. Yeah, And even people in the church, even the Christians, they'll go, well, okay, like, yeah, I understand why the divorce is happening, and maybe it's legitimate, but uh, you're still doing a divorce, and I just I just don't know if I can be there for you in that time, because what is it, does it mean I'm supporting a divorce, you know? And oh, you still Christians. have people who will, Boy. yeah, <laughs> you'll still have people who will say, like, oh, you know, you know what God thinks about divorce. 
I'm like, it's the well, same you... thing I think about divorce. <laughs> well, yeah, my views didn't really change. Um, yeah, I'm feel still the same about this. Yeah, I'm not a fan of this whole thing, but yeah. I'm still doing it. So hopefully that would tell you a little bit about what's happening with some of these things. Um, because people in the church, I feel like, and I mean, maybe that's not all churches, but I feel like at the very least in my part of the world, a lot of times the way people view it is like, if you're giving a divorce, it's because you gave up mm-hmm. and you, you, you just didn't try hard enough. Yep. And I, I got that comment from people, you know, why don't you give more chances? What, what are you doing mm-hmm. wrong? Why are you, are you just throwing in the towel? What's, what's the matter? There was even a family that didn't understand. And I had to and deal with like, family just, yeah. When people give these thoughts and feelings, it's like, I mean, some of them are like, are you sure you're gay or something? It's like, do you not think I've thought about this more than anybody else in my life? Like myself, I have thought about this way more than you, person walking past me in 20 seconds with an opinion that I didn't ask for. But oh, yeah. Gosh, yeah, well, that must be an even added layer to just yeah. like... Yeah. Well, yeah. and it was also one of those things of getting to know, even starting to get to know new people of saying, like, I'm in the divorce process. There were people that would be like, okay, well, they would start to pull back. And you didn't really want to get to know me because, oh, you're in the divorce process. So they really, for as non-taboo as maybe divorce has become in the secular world, the process of divorce is still considered taboo. And this thing of, okay, go over there, do your divorce, and when you're done, come back, and now we'll accept you. Now we'll take mm-hmm. care of you. It kind of continues maybe the Christian mindset of, oh, you have some stuff going on. Okay, well, go take care of yourself, clean up, and then come back, and we'll welcome you into to Jesus and God and will love you, but go just, go uh, take care of yourself first. Which is literally the exact opposite of what Christ did and called us to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and the another fun layer of this whole thing, which of course we're on Life is Ugly podcast. So for me as a queer man, mm-hmm. uh, there's the added layer of okay. I had people asking. I've had almost everyone ask me. I was about to oh. say, and I was like, I know absolutely <laughs> almost everyone asked. Like okay. So did you get, is the, are you getting divorced because you just realized you're, you're gay and you can't do it? And I'm going, no, that was actually not part of the reason. Yeah. Like, that's and that was been well established a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was very much part of the whole process at the beginning was the sexuality. That is not part of the process now. I'm not getting divorced because of my sexuality. That is not at all. If, I, if that was the, the decision, if that had been the breaking factor, that would have broken long ago. Not right. after years and years of being together and having a child together and building an entire life and looking for a future together. Yeah. And then the next question that would always come, and this is one of the things, this, this is one of the things that probably hurt the most. So mm-hmm. I, would, I would talk to friends, um, friends and, and people who knew me, and I would just bring them in and say, hey, this is, this is happening in my life, or... They would ask, how are you doing? What's new lately? And I, I would bring them up to speed. And there were several times when the first question they would ask is, oh my gosh, you're going side A, aren't you? <laughs> and I would just stop and go, that's... I just told you that I'm going through an extremely painful process of ending a relationship, ending a marriage trying to figure out my life now and not knowing literally what is happening even next month. And you're wanting to now talk about my theology. Mm -hmm. I was was dumbfounded at times. (laughs) Yeah. Because I also feel like you could totally change your theology and stay married. Yeah. Like there's, there's, there's even like, it's, it's a guy that was in, uh, some of our side B circles for a while and him, he did eventually go side A and he stayed with his wife. You know, he's mm-hmm. still married and everything. He's just now affirming. But it's like, no, yeah. that did that doesn't change my thoughts on, you know, monogamy and my feelings for my wife or any of that thing. If my theology were to change, like that has nothing to do with anything. I feel like the underlying question of that is much worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you know there's an added question they're asking, they're asking but not asking. So yeah, yeah, because they're not yeah. asking if you change any theological views. Yeah, yeah, they're asking if you change who you want to sleep with. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, and that was, 
again, I was like, this is in a, That's a wildly inappropriate. inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, this is inappropriate. This is not the time to ask me. Uh, yeah. This is I don't I don't want to talk theology. I just want. <laughs> Girl, you know what because... I do? Just ask him a completely ridiculous question. Just ask him a completely ridiculous and unacceptable question right back, and then watch them be stunned. And then uh, I do that at tactic and church. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> And they don't ask me anything else again. Oh my goodness! Like, <laughs> it's like, like and I, they never talk to me. Yeah, again. which is fine by me because I probably don't want to talk to them anyways. <laughs> but, so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, that was one of the things that made it hard. And there, there became a point in time just going, who do I, who do I talk to anymore about this? Who do I talk to? Who do mm-hmm. I share my my story with? Who do I share the the pain I'm going through? Because it seemed like okay, if I go to church. Am I going to face the people who are going to remind me of, oh, there's all these Bible verses that talk about divorce, and are you sure that you tried hard enough? Are you sure you gave enough chances? If I go to family, it's, oh, well, you know how this is going to make the family look, and you know how we feel, and, uh, you know, because I... Oh, I've, boo-hoo. Uh, yeah, I had a, a brother who got divorced, and the, it, my family, like, took it personally, which I, I still don't get, but they took it as a personal attack against them. And so, like, oh, gosh, my family's going to be like, how dare you do this to us? If I go to... My my queer friends, I'm going to be getting the. They're going to want to talk theology. They're going to find out, like, oh my goodness, are you going side A? What's going to happen here? And oh, it's so much worse than it came from like our own. Yeah, I, that's that was one of the things that made it hard. I was like, this is where I thought maybe I could come to. I this would be the space where I could come, like church, family. Okay, yeah, those those spaces. Maybe that's not the. Maybe that's not where my my close community is going to lie. Maybe I can come here, and I ended up being met with theological questions. I ended up being met with some guys asking, oh, so what are your boundaries now? And I'm going, that's... <laughs> oh, my God! Yeah. It's like, well, apparently they're further than they need to be right now with you. <laughs> <laughs> Just, okay, cool. This is fun. Um, yeah. Later. And so... <laughs> this is just, literally why I keep to myself in the side view of That's day. such a crazy <laughs> question, bro. Like, how? Yeah. It ended up, and it, like, it, it caught, ended up bringing to the point of just like, I don't know where to go anymore. I don't know what to do, and I don't, I don't know how to react. And right. so it basically stripped me from, I, I had community still, but I ended up feeling very much in the, in the middle of just like, I don't really have anyone that's close enough to me for the day to day. I don't have someone that's in those moments when I wake up in the morning and go, where, where, what's happened to my life? Mm-hmm. When I come back at the end of the day of work and realize I'm coming home to a not so welcoming house. Mm-hmm. Um, or when I moved and I realized I'm coming home to an empty apartment when I used mm-hmm. to come home to my daughter. Yeah. yeah, I I don't, uh, I don't have like I don't tuck her into bed at night. I don't have the monitor sitting next to me anymore, and I can listen to the sound machine. Like I don't I don't have who who do I talk to in those times? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that just broke my heart. Oh my goodness. Honestly, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so like I, it's hard enough for me because yeah. I work nights. And like I said, my son's still very, very young. He's still like at a year and a half. So it's like, I'm very happy that I got to spend like most of his first year with him. But like working nights and then, you know, his dad has to put him in bed and everything. And that's perfectly fine. I definitely want him sleeping when I get home because I'm tired. (laughs) But like the fact that like sometimes, you know, just that I can't do that myself. Like that's hard enough. And I'm, I'm with him every day. Like I I can, can't even imagine. Yeah, that was... The, the the move up to Chicago, while in some ways it was extremely healthy and beneficial, yeah. it was also yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. And it was heartbreaking to think that the only way that I could not have my life continue to go in a spiral downward was to be away from my daughter. The 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 pain and the the, the agony of that was overwhelming at times. And so, I mean, in that, I took the community I could find sometimes. So I'm not... <laughs> there were some times that I wondered, do I do I go side A? Yeah. Do I 
will let go of those boundaries. And then sometimes I did go let go of those boundaries because I was just grasping for what I could find and what I could yeah. get. Right. Ooh, yeah. Thanks for sharing. And, I got that. And just, yeah, just when you, I went from having community and having a church, a, a family, a, a queer community. I had like all these spaces where like I could go there and I felt like there were spaces where I could be completely known. And then to suddenly have all of that chipped away and I'm left by myself with not even my daughter. And I, with... uh, yeah. Yeah. Back into I'll, say, I just... <laughs> I'll say with all that. Cause like, it's like, you know, you definitely all the ways that you lost your community and having to deal with that loss. What do you think was like, what helped you the most to be, to be resilient and push through almost kind of like, I would say to the other side, but like you said, now you're definitely in a different place than you were when everything really came crashing down. You know, you're a little more, a little more stable now. You're a little more set where you are and everything. Yeah. Uh, so back in beginning of 2021, when things were crumbling down, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to try to figure out what the Bible says about pain and suffering. I, I've read it all before, but like, I want that's what I'm focusing on. So it was like a right. month where all I read was uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentations. Mm. Just how you so, like going. Throw it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just like, let's just do them all. <laughs> If if the Bible could talk back to me, it'd be like, buddy, are you okay? Like, what is going on? <laughs> you got to read something else. But I, I went through there and I basically said, okay, God, what what do you what do you say about suffering, God? What is that? What are you actually saying about pain and suffering? Um, and there was a moment of sitting on the couch one night, and I, I just I said, God, I said, I just I want there to be someone else. Why can't I have someone? with me who just mm. knows who just knows what i'm going through who just sees what i'm going through and it can actually just mm. be there for me um and i realized in that moment that there wasn't actually going to be another physical person who could do that exactly mm -hmm. there's people who are going to know what the experience is like there's going to be people who can relate there's going to be people who can be with me but as far as someone who actually feels the same pain i realized that the only one who feels that pain with me it is God. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I sat there and I said, okay, God, if you're going to feel this pain with me, I said, then you're going to be the one that's going to have to get me through the next hour. Yep. The next day. So you're going to be the one that's going to, if you, if that's true, then I need you to actually be with me. Mm -hmm. So that way I know that, Every pain I feel, every heartache, every time I sit there and look at an empty bedroom, or every time I sit there and I see Ooh. an old memory, I said, I want to know that you're right there with me, that you're sitting there next to me, and that you that your heart breaks just as much as mine. And it's and like you're asking God to meet you in the place that the healing has not occurred. You don't know if it's going to occur. Ooh. Cha, why did we do this in the morning without cocktails? Oh my goodness, you are breaking my heart, making me cry over here. Oh, yeah, you're so, so sweet. The thank you for your thank vulnerability. You. Oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That the resilience just came from sitting there and going, "Okay, I'm. I just. I have to feel this pain. This yeah. pain is is not going to go away." right now it's gonna stay there and so i basically said okay god if you're gonna feel the pain with me then maybe i can make it through and so mm -hmm. there have been a lot of painful days and there still are some painful days um and there's some days when i'm like oh, screw it i'm grasping for what i can get and at least it's some not great decisions but i'm just going okay but at the end of it i still come back and i go all right so god that didn't work out the way i wanted to i don't feel better um, or I'm just, I just numbed my pain. I'm just, it was still there, but I sit with him. Mm. I sit with God on all this. Um, and I, I created a playlist on Spotify towards the beginning of 2021. Yeah. I, I was listening through random stuff on there and the classic old song, beauty from pain mm. uh, for my 
for all of my uh, millennials out there who grew up yes. listening to that. Um, that came on, and so I literally created a playlist called Beauty from Pain. Um, okay, send me that link when you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will. And it's like, it, I mean, gosh. The, it's a, Dean it's got the, the playlist. playlist to cry to. <laughs> yeah. I've got the playlist to cry to. It has classics on there. And, like, it has some, like, Beauty from Pain was, like, the first one on there. And then, if you know anything about the Broadway musical Six, about the Six Not Wives much. of Henry VIII, there's a gorgeous song in there called Heart of Stone where one of the wives sings, like, no matter what is done to me, my heart will remain strong because it's made of stone. Mm. Um, and she talks about how that is will how that keeps her love for her child going no matter what. That song got it on there. And the song that, like, broke everything for me was, honestly, Robin's Dancing on My Own. Woo! Oh, my God. The Callum Scott version, too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> that song, because, again, what I realized at the end of the day... Is that, yeah, it might just be me, mm-hmm. like physically right here, mm-hmm. but I can keep going. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what I see, what's going on. I have a choice that I can just keep going. It's gonna hurt like a mother. It's gonna be painful, and there are gonna be days that I'm gonna sit there and just go, "When will this agony end?" Mm-hmm. But I can make it to the end of the day. Amen. <sighs> Gosh, it's like, hey, yeah, just like, yeah. give us this day our daily bread. It's like, God, just today. I just need to make it through the day to tomorrow. And then tomorrow, I just need to make it through tomorrow. Yeah. Right. The, for Lamentations being as much of a, a pouring out of the heart it is, there's a moment where, in chapter three, where the author cries out and he goes, God, please come save me. And then, mm-hmm. again, for being sorrowful and talking about the rejection that is faced is a verse that it says, God heard me. God heard my cry. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what I grasp onto. That, you know what? Yeah, there's sometimes where all God in my ear is the screams and cries from me, but he hears me. Mm. And that's where that resilience has to come from, is literally just by God knowing that God hears me, no matter what. Ooh. Knowing that God hears you no matter what is where your strength comes from. Resilience. I love that. That's where your um, resilience comes from. Yeah. Where does my help come from? From the maker of heaven and earth. Come on now. Amen. Love that. Um, my King David. <sighs> okay. Well, I just, what if there's something like, let's say somebody's listening right now and they're maybe going through this or something similar. What is something that you wish you would have heard or said to you that maybe you could encourage someone with right now or just give practical advice on? Um, uh, the, this was something I, I actually ended up doing accidentally and I, I'm glad I did it. I went to someone who had gone through a divorce process and I said, what well, I just said, please tell me what to do and what was it like and what did you have to do? Yeah. Uh, and I really just thought, and honestly, I just focused, I, it was a friend of mine that he's one of the ones that moved away and honestly I would not have made it through 2021 without him while he was yeah. living nearby um absolutely love this guy straight guy but I love yeah. him to death no matter what I mean we all have our faults <laughs> <laughs> but I would I would sit with him and I he had been through a divorce like a decade prior and so I just said like what what was it like for you what did you do what did you go through and he just he told me he talked about it. he even showed me his divorce papers, what the forms looked like, filled out. Yeah. Um, and that was, ended up being helpful. I didn't do that really because I thought, oh, I should be smart and like plan ahead. No, I was just like, I was grasping for something at that point. And that was a day when I was just sitting with him and it just came out of the blue of like, I just needed to ask someone something. Um, but it ended up being very helpful because as I started the process and even got to the paperwork, I was like, oh, I actually recognize some of this paperwork. I know what things need to be filled out. Or I know what some of this has to look like. And it was a very practical thing that ended up helping in the confusion. Yeah. Because in addition, it also meant that, oh, someone else managed to get through this mess. Right, yeah. On the other side, they're alive, they're happy, they're well, they're you know living a good life. Like I could actually see someone on the other side. Mm-hmm. of this maze and know that it's possible to make it through so that's something to do so if someone's 
for someone who is entering this process, it's a decision that's just been made, um, or they're in the midst of it. Find that person who's already on the other side, and literally just say, "Tell me about what you went through. Tell me about that." Um, and take encouragement from the fact that they made it, and right, yeah. keep holding on to that. Yeah. And we have one last question before you go today to finish our episode. This is a new thing we've added this okay. season that we're trying to do. We've been asking our guests as like a closing question. Mm-hmm. Like if you could go talk to your younger self, like at any stage in life, what is a piece of advice or something that you would have wished to tell that younger you? Oh, man. Oof, that's fun. Uh, I think that I would probably end up going, I would go to 17-year-old Dean, who was just about to enter college, and, I mean, I, I think what I would just say is just, part of you would want to be like, my, my say would be like, go get, go get help, you need it, and you know you need it. <laughs> um, but, realis- <laughs> but realistically, I would sit down and just go, you know, you're about to you're about to have some very painful years ahead and you haven't really known you're about to unravel like how painful things have been for you in the past because you're about to encounter a lot of new pains Mm -hmm. and just know you don't have to do that alone you can find people you can talk to people you can open up to people you don't have to be mr perfect which was my name in high school. Oh, wow. You don't have to be Mr. Perfect. You can let the walls down. You can be yourself. You can be vulnerable and open and get help. And that will make the next everything (laughs) so much better and easier. That's great. Okay, sounds like older Dean is a lot wiser and a lot more seasoned in life than younger Dean. <laughs> we love oh, that. <laughs> there's no comparison there. Trust me. I was a moron at 17. <laughs> Ooh, we all, oh my gosh. Okay. I love that. Well, thank you so much for just bearing your heart and your soul on this episode with us. Um, it clearly took you to a place. No, I'm thinking now is like, great. Now he's alone as like after just like bearing his heart. So like I'm gonna find a way to buy you a cup of coffee or a drink today. <laughs> but, like, Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. But, um I'm thankful for the opportunity uh to share. Yeah. Um, so Well, Dean, Thank we you. love you dearly, so thank you so much. And yeah, send that playlist <laughs> over. To our to Josh, and we'll get it out to the listeners somehow. Um, I know I'll need it today. Oh, yeah, sure you know, yeah, I love sad music anyway. So like that is my entire aesthetic and my mood. So um, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> anyways, we hope to have you on again, and maybe even just talk about if when you get to the other. Not if was when you will, but it's like when you get to the complete healing of that so we'd love to have you back on and just chat me through that absolutely thank you so much all right until next time this is uh, life on side beat